What a wonderful opportunity we're going to have tonight. I'm honored to be here with two of the most legendary entrepreneurs of modern times. For different reasons, but well known anyways. Think of Branson, for example. What's remarkable about Richard is he has created multiple billion dollar enterprises that have nothing to do with each other. That's extremely rare. When you see entrepreneurship, it's often around a core, technology or consumer goods, whatever. He's music, he's space, he's Hyperloop, he's all over the map. And he's been remarkably successful. We're gonna find out how he did that. Michael is an extraordinary individual in the sense that he created a whole new class of capital. It funded thousands of businesses and created millions of jobs. We have to mine that data tonight too. My job tonight is to take us on a journey. We're gonna go and explore what makes great entrepreneurs, how they did it, and what they can teach us going into the future. And I wanna start with a story. I arrived from Miami having had lunch with a whole group of young entrepreneurs. I like to get my portfolio companies together every quarter because they haven't met each other and there's constant new businesses coming in and plying a little wine into them often gets you the real story of what's going on in their businesses. The conversation went this way. This is only a few 30, 40 hours ago. 25 of them sitting at dinner in Miami and I heard this word. Billionaires are going to go and become extinct. Now, the old Kevin O'Leary would have washed their mouths out with soap, but I have learned to be tolerant because you can't hear the train coming down to run you over if you don't have your ear to the track. You have to shut up and listen. I've never heard that before from a young woman who's a spectacular entrepreneur. Her vision of the future is it's not just about the money. And I like that, but I'm hoping she does become a billionaire because I own a lot of her company and I reminded her of that. <laughs> then I arrive here just in time to hear the keynote at the World Government Summit, where I learned that global warming is not the number one threat to the earth, it's capitalism. That's news to me. I like to go to sleep with the television on. I read once that Lenin called it an electronic fireplace and it keeps me, puts me to sleep. When I woke up this morning, the lower third said, war on wealth. Ladies and gentlemen, I have two of the soon to be extinct species sitting beside me right here. <laughs> so let's get right at it and ask, what the hell is going on out there? Because this is a remarkable issue that is emerging, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Let's start with you, Michael. What do you think? I think when you, uh, when you look at some of the situations that have occurred and how people, particularly in the West, so I don't know about all over the world, but if you look at the United States and you polls of people under 30 and how many think their life's gonna be better than their parents, 75% it's not. If you go to France, 84% say their life is not gonna be better than their parents or Spain. And all of Western Europe, the highest percentage who think their life is gonna be better than their parents would be in Germany at 30. And so what is making them feel this way? If you look at recent polls that show in the United States, 51%, 51% of millennials feel that maybe socialism or communism would be better than a free enterprise society. Or, but even more shocking to me, 25 or so percent of baby boomers, of baby boomers, those 54 to 72, think maybe socialism would be better. So one, maybe they don't know what socialism is. Or two, particularly in the last decade, the growth in markets for a number of reasons has left them behind, and they're feeling that the capitalist system, the free enterprise system, wasn't working for them. And if you think of young people, uh, student loans in the United States are one and a half trillion, and you cannot get rid of a student loan <clears throat> today even if you go bankrupt. 
Many of them remember when their parents might have lost their home or someone came and during the 08, 09 difficult financial period. So their interaction with the financial system hasn't necessarily been positive. The other thing that occurred is more people started investing in real estate. Schiller won a Nobel Prize for telling us that if you had invested in residential real estate in the United States over the last 120 years, adjusted for inflation, you have a zero rate of return. If you had invested in equities adjusted for inflation, you have a thousand times your money. So they have not participated, and I think it's the challenge, the free enterprise system, to get them involved and make them feel. Now, this is the West. If you go to Vietnam, 95% of the people believe in the free enterprise system. You go to China, 78%. Uh, of the people feel their life is going to be better than their parents. You go to Mexico, 85 percent. So I think what you're seeing here really is more dominated in the U.S. I would say since we're going to link this to entrepreneurs, <clears throat> I have the honor of financing more than 3,000 companies. Only one CEO ever told me he was in it for the money. Wealth was a byproduct of creating value. That passion and other things they had drove them. And so I think our goal right now is to make sure the financial system is working for everyone and everyone feels they have a chance. So this is a wake up call for us, Kevin. Richard, Michael's suggesting there may be a linkage to GDP growth in terms of happiness with capitalism. He was mentioning countries that have four, five, six, seven percent GDP growth where you don't see this kind of rhetoric. Do you think that's a linkage or? Why do you think it's happening? And what solutions can you offer to this? Well, I, <clears throat> first of all, I agree with everything Mike ha has, has said. I mean, that we, we uh, again, have to try to do everything we can to lift the vast majority of people um, up. Um, and, and for a number of years, the vast majority of people haven't um, made, you know, seen, seen their living standards increasing year, year after year. Um, having said that, I mean, ne uh, the w week after next, I'm throwing a big concert on the, the border of Venezuela, and we're trying to uh, get um, a whole mass of trucks with, with, um, with food and water and medical supplies into Venezuela. Um, socialism did not work in Venezuela. Um, it's resulted in a, a bankrupt country, um, or worse. And, um, and uh, people need to remember what socialism was like in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, when, when governments ran the, the trains, when governments ran, you know, everything, the British Airways and so on, um, it, it, really, it really didn't, didn't work that well. So, um, so I don't think we should th throw out capitalism, but, but we definitely need, um, you know, for those of us who are fortunate to have made a lot of wealth, um, we have an incredible responsibility to sp spread that wealth around, to tackle some of the big problems of this world. Um, and if we don't, you know, we, we will deserve to be, um, you know, to be, to be to, uh, you know, have very heavy taxes levered upon us. So, um, you know, so we, we do have great responsibility. I think, Kevin, um, one of the things that's occurred, if we want to say that a lot of this movement is centered in the United States today, if you look at the United States, the United States of all countries with more than 20 million people has the highest percentage of its population that is worth a million dollars or more, 6.4 percent, alongside Australia. If you look at average net worth, the United States is second in this group to Australia. However, if you look at median net worth, where 50 percent of the people are below the line, the U.S. has the lowest net worth of all developed countries, similar to Greece. So there's a large group of individuals who are poor. The U.S. of all developed countries has the highest percentage of its population with a net worth under 10,000. So it's understandable how they feel about this issue. And if we're going to create a great life for our children, and our grandchildren, 
everyone has to feel at least they had a chance. And that, in my opinion, is what's defined capitalism, that you have a chance, not based on your religion, not based on being a man or a woman, uh, not based on where you went to school and who your parents are, but based on your ability, your creativity, your ideas, your drive, your persistence. And we have got to create that message and find a way to deliver it. Richard does every day by his speeches, launching new businesses and recreating industries. And we have to find a way that everyone feels they have that opportunity. That is the challenge to the free enterprise system, and I think we'll meet that challenge here. Richard, before we leave this topic, the rhetoric coming out of many um, politicians currently, even in the U.S. and outside, regarding examples of socialism not working over an extended 100-year period is this. They push back saying, wait a second, Venezuela is not in its current situation because of socialism. It's there because of bad management. We need better management and socialism to provide more equality and distribution of wealth. That's the next generation of socialism, socialism 2.0. Now, that's a damn good way to sell socialism if you're trying to sell it. Do you believe it? Um, I, got, I think I go back to, to this belief that you know, if, you, if you are successful and you make, you make good money, you do not leave that money sitting on the bank account. Uh, you've invested in creating new businesses, employing new people, uh, make sure you, you look after your people well. Um, uh, tackling you know, the, big, the big issues of this world, I mean, last week we had a, something called audacious ideas where we got some of the wealthiest people together every year on NECA and you know, we go out and you know, try to make sure that the, that the big ideas in the world can be tackled. Um, uh, I think you know, that's, you know, that, that's the positive way. Now, um, socialism, uh, I mean, the, the, if you have to point to one country where socialism has worked, and I don't think you can find one, um, and it's not just bad leaders, it's just the, uh, um, I mean, the exciting thing about the people in this room, I mean, the, 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 anybody who has an idea to make people's lives better can start a business, um, and if it is going to make people's lives better, their business is likely to be successful, and they have become capitalists de facto. Um, and the reason that Abu Dhabi is, uh, is um, doing so well, and Dubai, and you know, other, other countries in Europe and so on is, is because we have many, many entrepreneurs who are um, you know, making a mark, not making a mark to make fortunes from themselves, to make, they're, they're trying to create something they can be proud of. The byproduct of creating something that you can be proud of is that wealth comes your way, and, and then responsibility, and then you've just got to you know, keep investing and, and, and creating other things you can be proud of. I think, Kevin, if you think about a natural resource society. A natural resource society has many challenges. It might not create many jobs. It lends itself uh, to a socialist environment. If you take over the Venezuela oil company, it has the most proven reserves. You can use its cash flow. You don't have to make anything work. But as we saw, you had to be able to pump oil, and the amount of oil has decreased by 50%. I look at that compared to the UAE. Natural Resource Society fostered the free enterprise system, incentives, and had good leadership. So one of the questions is, can socialism in the long term have great leadership? I think Richard's challenging you. It probably can't. The free enterprise system constantly challenges the best, the brightest, the new ideas, you wish there wasn't change. And I think the other element is why do people feel this way today? And I particularly say this in Western Europe and the US, it's partly because of technology. You know, cable challenges in the media, challenges in manufacturing, challenges in agriculture, challenges in transportation. What you knew uh, is being challenged today. And so the firm footing that I might have worked in a coal mine, but I might not have that job in the future. I might have been a driver, but I might not have that job. This uncertainty has created an environment, I think, that people are concerned about the future. Let's and take a tack to a more optimistic place. 
Entrepreneurship, leadership, and trying to divine which entrepreneurs to back and which to let go. You've been doing this your whole life. I imagine you get pitched 10 deals a week. Richard, you're the same. How do you figure out which ones deserve to have the sun shine on them and which remain in darkness? And I'm just talking about capital. Can you divine, is there three things you can tell me that you found in a constant between different entrepreneurs that make them successful? Passion, passion for what they do. I think empathy, seeing the world through others, and the ability to communicate it. You know, it's the world, it's not size anymore. Size does not protect you. And so it's new ideas. And I think many people in finance were so focused on the balance sheet or income or results from the past rather than what the future was like. <clears throat> Great leaders can take a difficult situation, turn around and make it good. Poor leaders can take a good situation and have it deteriorate. There is this leadership of change. And so to me, I always focused on what was not on the balance sheet, and that is the talent of the management and the talent of leadership. You know, a leader has to convince people to follow him and have that passion and vision. And you can see it in their eyes. I'm sure you see it in the short presentations on Shark Tank. But there is a difference between, and once capital was no longer constrained, which occurred during the 1970s and 80s, if you look at the United States, small and medium companies created 62 million jobs in the last third of the 20th century, and large companies created minus four. So now the large company didn't have the protection that they were the only one who had access to capital. So to me, who is the leadership? What is their vision? What is their commitment? And you have one to your left here that we would all follow around the world. Statement that uh, Michael just made, leadership versus management. Can you be a great leader and a poor manager? Yeah, I mean, we've had, uh, uh, if I go back to my record company days, we had a wonderful entrepreneur running our French company um, who uh, was just very, very entrepreneurial and um, was great at setting up, you know, the Virgin Megastore on the Champs Elysees and you know lots of other Virgin companies in France. Um, we had a very solid manager running our company in Germany who was not interested in uh, creating Virgin Megastores or Virgin Trains or Virgin Airlines or other things, um, but was equally valuable to us. Because Which one got fired? Uh, neither got far. They were, they were both equally valuable, and, and both of them, uh, I mean, the one in France was a good delegator, so he found people to run the record company, he found people to uh, run, the, run the Virgin Megastores and our other you know, publishing companies and so on. Um, he was great at motivating these people um, and bringing out the best in these people and praising these people and, uh, and having a, a vision and a mission that they could all, they could all buy into. Um, likely, likewise, the, 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 the guy in Germany, because he wasn't entrepreneurial, we had to get an entrepreneur in, into Germany to do, to, to do that side. So, um, yeah, so, you, you know, often you can find great people doing with great different skills within a company. Kevin, two points, you know, there's only one industry that really puts people on the balance sheet, that's professional sports. They put their contracts on the balance sheet, but you know, Steve Jobs wasn't on the balance sheet, et cetera. And the second point, I, I just want to come back to the size issue. In the late 1970s, I met this man named Bill McGowan, who believed in fiber optics and changing the telecommunication industry. So he went into this industry. There was a company with 99% market share, AT&T. AT&T had 1.4 million employees. And Bill, at the time I met him, had 30. And my firm was resident and resisted financing MCI. And I developed this whole strategy that they were right. It really wasn't a fair competition, in that I felt that um, you needed, AT&T needed 
at least 100,000 employees for every employee at MCI to offset them. So they needed three million, they only had a million and a half, they could not compete. And eventually, you saw MCI eventually led to the breakup in AT&T. And that vision, AT&T that you know today really isn't AT&T, as you know, Kevin, it's Southwest Bell that was bought by it. And mobile, the vision on mobile of Craig McCall, AT&T invented mobile technology. 1979, there's a meeting with McKinsey with a report telling AT&T there'll be one million customers in the world in the year 2000 paying $1,000 a year, a billion dollar market. It was too small for them to go in. So they invented it and decided not to go into mobile. So it is not size, it's that on the ability to see and the ability to lead that makes the difference. It was size up till the early 1970s when capital was denied. But today, as you know, when you're bidding on Shark Tank, you can get outbid. There's a lot of capital around for good ideas. Richard, in the late 1990s, um, I was an operator in a consumer software company, an educational software, and my marketing manager came in um, and said to me, there's a guy named Richard Branson that's jumping out of an airplane. The business has nothing to do with jumping out of airplanes. Why don't you go jump out of an airplane? Because he's on every television network in the country. And I must admit, and I'm going to be honest here, I have ripped a page out of your playbook. Television and supporting businesses and to reduce customer acquisition cost is my model now. I stole that from you. Was it a conscious effort in those days? Because you were doing outrageous stuff. But it was always tied to a launch of a product or a business. And you got tons of free press long before social media was a factor. So um, uh, it started uh, as a way to promote. We had one, one plane uh, with Virgin Atlantic, one second hand 747. Uh, we didn't have the advertising clout that British Airways had with their 300 planes. Um, so for the first thing we decided to do was let, let's break the transatlantic uh, speed record on a boat. And um, fortunately, as it turned out, we sank. Um, and, and the word virgin was sticking out of the water. Um, so, you know, we had the front pages of every paper. Um, our, our airline took a full page ad saying, you know, next time Richard take the plane. Um, and, um, and then the following year, we came back and we were successful. Um, but then, it's, then I think I just got the, I got the, um, uh, the bug. And um, we then you know, decided to be the first to cross the Atlantic in a balloon and then the Pacific and try to go around the world in a balloon. And, um, and I wasn't doing it so much to promote the businesses, but the, yeah, the byproduct was that it, 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 um, uh, it really helped the businesses. Um, Later on, we, we, we went on to more serious, fun, fun ways of promoting things. I mean, last week, you had the Super Bowl in America. Um, well, a few years ago, our airship company was asked to uh, fly an airship over the, over the Super Bowl to film the Super Bowl for NBC. Um, and we had a big fly virgin on the side, and, and they, they made it very clear, Super Bowl ads are the most expensive in the year. They will not show any cameras on the side of our airship. Um, so, after about five minutes of flying the airship, we unfurled the banner outside the back of the airship, which said, NBC cameramen are the best looking guys in the whole of America. And, we, and the cameras just kept coming up and seeing Fly Virgin on the side. So, um, so we, that's another cheeky way of doing it. Nice. Very nice. Michael, one, one of the um, outcomes of, of uh, coming here today, and, and as the word got out, we were going to do this this evening, I started getting a lot of texts with individual questions for both of you. I want to touch on some of those because thematically there were many that were the same. And so I'd like to cover some of those. I'm going to ask you some questions on both of you. There is a tremendous amount of interest um, from many people that would like you to make a call on the U.S. market for the back end of this year, because there's a lot of angst out there. And you've been through many, many cycles of both debt and equity, and they don't want you to hedge it. They want to know what you actually think. What are you doing with your money? That was the question. Well, I'm not in the market every day like I used to. So therefore, I can't make a call. 
Uh, my belief is it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. And every day you can look in the paper, some stocks are making new highs, some stocks are making new lows. And so to me, what is the company doing? What are the services? What does it have available to it? You know, food tech today, a tremendous revolution in agriculture. The ability to sequence your genome, we now know if you're selling products, whether they're healthy or not healthy for you. Today, in the UAE, they put 100% tax on soft drinks. Are you not going to answer this question? My comment to you is there's some companies that are going to do well, those that are pro perceived as doing value for society, and then some not. So I can't predict the stock market, but I can predict that if you're in industries of the future, you will do well. And I would say to you, many of the industries of the future are going to deal with elder care. Since we have aging populations, many of those industries are going to solve our problems in health. And many of those industries are going to deal with new products and services to prevent obesity, prevent diabetes, and other diseases. So when I think of investing, I try to invest what are the challenges of society? What companies or industries are going to answer those challenges? And that's what my portfolio reflects. Top of the hit parade for you, Richard, was this. Make him answer the question about Brexit. Make a call on what's going to happen here. Um, well, Brexit, uh, in my personal opinion, is the worst thing that's happened to Britain and the worst thing that's happened to Europe since the Second World War. Um, it's already wreaked havoc on the British economy. We had the highest GDP uh, before um, the Brexit referendum. Uh, we now have pretty well the lowest in Europe. Um, gro growth is um, at a 10-year low. Um, and uh, if uh, God forbid, uh, hard Brexit takes place um, in the next six weeks. Um, the, the pound will, in my opinion, drop to parity with the dollar, uh, and I'm afraid it will deserve to because um, the, uh, the, you know, the effect it will have on airlines and I mean, a whole, whole new, numerous sectors of the economy is going is to be dramatic. So um, I just hope that um, sense will prevail. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, I would, I would love to see another referendum because a lot of the older people who, you know, voted for Brexit have died out. Younger people are, uh, <laughs> young, 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 younger people are coming up. Um, and and it's, the young, it's the young who are going to suffer the most from, from Brexit. They won't be able to live and work and play in, in wonderful places like Spain and Greece and um, Italy and, you know, I mean, we're just, we're just putting a barrier up and saying, thank you, we want to be Little England in the future. Specifically probabilities on three outcomes. Hard exit, no deal, a new referendum, and what would the outcome be of that would be the second derivative question. And lastly, somehow your prime minister figures out a way to broker a deal, which all the signaling this week at the World Conference was there's no tolerance at the EU for any changes to the agreement. And they were very clear about that. What do you think, just on those specifics? Um, I think if, uh, if the Prime Minister's deal goes through, it, it is going to cost Britain a lot of money, but not as much as a hard Brexit. And if that's the only choice, then, um, you know, then I think we'll, we'll just have to accept that. And then there will be people in Britain who will fight for another day to get, to get back into Europe and be part of Europe. Um, I mean, what I wish for uh, is, that, um, is that that deal you know, is not accepted and that she is brave enough to go back to the British people and ask for another referendum. The problem for her is that it's likely to tear the Tory party apart, but it, it's certainly the right thing for the country. And the question is, you know, will she be making a decision for her party or will she be making a decision for the country? Kevin, I just want to comment on that. Um, I have heard many times in my life the world is coming to an end. Uh, what I consider to be the most important 
financial period post-World War II was the mid-1970s. Stock market went down 50 percent, interest rates doubled, <clears throat> credit controls were put in, price of oil quadrupled, uh, projections that hundreds of the largest companies were going to go bankrupt, New York was going to go bankrupt, etc. None of that occurred. Here, I think, as Richard pointed out, this is a very difficult situation today. But when I think of Great Britain, and I think of World War II, and you see those movies that came out a couple years ago on Churchill, etc., those days, it's just hard for me to believe that this, this has anything can even be compared to that situation where the existence of democracy or freedom as we knew it was on the line. And the unbelievable courage of the leaders uh, in Britain and the people uh, in many ways allowed the world to be what it is today. So I'm... Yeah, I think, that, I mean, I, I, I would agree with what you say, except I think it's worth remembering that Europe was formed at the end of that Second World War by Churchill and, and by the other European leaders to make sure that we would never go to war again. And every single generation b before mine, uh, my father fought uh, in, in, in throughout Europe. My grandfather was in the trenches and gassed in Europe. And it goes back generation after generation. And, and, and we mustn't forget this. And, um, and that's, I think, another consequence, um, another danger of starting to see the breakup of Europe. Um, you know, it, you've got something that's by no means perfect, but, but you know, don't, uh, we've got to fight to try to avoid it being broken up. Michael, here's your political question. So okay? I'd like to ask Richard a question. Do you feel that the leadership, if they felt they had another vote, that Brexit would be turned down, if they felt confident of that, that they would move in that direction? The, the opinion polls clearly say that uh, people believe Brexit, would, that, you know, voting for a Brexit was a Those mistake. polls were useless last time. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm, but the opinion polls have been very consistently going up and up and up um, over, over the last two years. And um, so, um, so personally, I believe it would be a clear cut, um, you know, no, no to Brexit. Um, the, you know, what the leaders believe, the problem is that in the, you know, sitting around the prime minister, she's got a bunch of, uh, you know, people who want to put up the borders, you know, um, you know extreme right wing, um, uh, and then she's got a bunch who want another referendum. And it, you know, it, it, so I don't think it's, you're going to get a, you know, she's just going to have to make a decision herself in the end, and she's going to have to be brave. Michael, your question uh, deals with U.S. politics for a moment here. Many want to know um, your opinion. Leave the rhetoric out of it, okay? This is the backup to this question. Um, I'll give you some data here that it's real. It's not academic. I've got 40 portfolio companies, all private, small, in almost every state in the U.S. They had their best cash flow quarter in history last quarter, not because of tax reform, because of deregulation. The policy is working. The politics are crazy. So the question is this. What's your opinion about the outcome of the upcoming election? Because the two policy directions are dramatically different. And so these are people, actually, that want to know the risk mitigation of changing American policy given the success of the economy. Forget the politics, the success of the economy. They're trying to mitigate risk and make a decision about capital expenditures. What do you think happens? Does Trump get another term with his policies, or is this wave of whatever you want to call it going to sweep into America? This is really about capital flow. I think it's, in my own opinion, way too early. President Bush, 41, had an 80 percent approval rating 10 months before the election and didn't win. Uh, I think it's a question of what is the discussion. Is Mike Bloomberg going to run for president? The discussion would change dramatically on the Democratic ticket. Is Howard Schultz going to continue his efforts to run for president? I think it changes the dialogue. and so. I think the f question is, what is the dialogue a year from now? And so I think you made an important point. 
For 20 years, I owned a company called Vistage. It's like a for-profit YPO. Over 10,000 CEOs. And if you ask them, small and medium businesses, what did they want? They wanted really three things. One, they wanted to know that the administration believed in the free enterprise system. That's the first thing they wanted to know. The second thing they wanted to know is, could they open their laundry mats? Could they run? <clears throat> or is there a new regulator, a new regulation every day? Can we get the regulatory burden? We want to build our business. Can you let us build our business? We are too small to have 15, 20 people dealing with each of these areas. And the last thing they wanted to know is, can they bring manufacturing or can they do more things in the United States where they could get a tax code similar to what occurred in Ireland, et cetera? These are the three things that 10,000 CEOs were interested of small and medium businesses. This administration has brought those three and has allowed, as you've pointed out, small and medium business. They also brought something else, and that is opportunity zones. So we've identified more than 1,000 areas in the United States that you can invest, and you don't have to pay a capital gain on appreciation. You can reinvest your money. Well, I can do that in the UAE, and I can do that in Hong Kong, and I can do that in Singapore. But we've designated these areas for rebuilding. We have a good year or a year and a half to see whether we've taken up the mantle in many of these troubled areas of America and redeployed capital to create that. So my opinion is I'd wait for a year, and I think the dialogue is heavily dependent on who is running on the Democratic Party for the answer. Interesting. A good way to not answer, but you're being honest about it. You don't know what's going to happen. I want to get to space in a minute, but I have one more question about um, competition of nations, because there are some huge capital flows moving around. I'm an indexer. I work on watching money move from one geography to another, and I'm always intrigued as to why. I have an example for you, gentlemen, and I want to talk about the global situation. And we're in an environment here where this country has been very successful in using their own capital and growing others' interest in bringing theirs here, too. Let's take North America for a second. Trump gets elected, changes tax policy, deregulates. Um, removes any vestige of a carbon tax or anything to do with paying for the environment, whether you like that or not, it's a fact. It made it very attractive for capital. North of the border, it went in a different direction. Um, a more distribution of wealth mandate, a, un a new young prime minister brought in a 70% tax rate for Canadians, 53 plus 16 or 50, 13% VAT tax plus 3% carbon tax, takes a Canadian to over 70% tax. In a matter of 36 months, Direct investment in the Canadian economy dropped by 52%. Hundreds of thousands of jobs were lost. It never happened this fast before in any country. And as a result, the young prime minister faces a dilemma next October. He may not get elected again. Now, when you start to watch the successes of geographies changing policy and seeing the rapid movement of capital, what is going to happen going forward? Do you think countries will compete for that capital? Because it doesn't seem to have any borders anymore. Money moves to the lowest risk and the highest probability of outcomes, and this country is a good example of it. So when you start thinking about being an investor and policy and returns, does that not dictate the future of where capital will go and where entrepreneurs will be? And that may be Asia. Richard? Um, well, I think you've sort of answered your own question, but I think the... I think the um, uh, you mentioned climate change. I mean, I just sort of, if I, if I, I'm not going to answer your question specifically here. But, um, uh, climate change is, in my opinion, one of the, bi the biggest threats facing this world. Um, and governments should be doing something about it. Not Canada unilaterally doing it, but on a global basis. This should be a carbon tax. And I'm uh, I'm an airline owner. I, I run spaceships. I've got, you know, But that carbon tax ships. may cost the politician his job. The, 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 if it's a universal carbon tax, and then you give clean energy companies that money back, so you actually then start creating a differential between, uh, you know, dirty fuel and clean fuel, 
um, you will um, you will see soon see the clean energy business uh, thriving, and and you'll soon see the world mo moving towards clean energy. Um, I mean, politicians ought to be thinking longer than the next two or three years in office. They should they've got to sell it right to their to their people. And I think again, young people overwhelmingly realize the world has a problem and they, they want the politicians to do more. Kevin, um, I would, couldn't agree with um, Richard Moore. I believe you can create financial incentives. He spoke about a carbon tax. I believe you can create financial incentives to solve these issues. Uh, Richard, Dr. Sandor, affiliated with the Milken Institute, in the mid-1980s, you might remember, we were all gonna die of sulfur dioxide, acid rain. Movies, books, all written about it. A credit was created that you had to reduce your admissions. If you couldn't reduce them, you had to buy a credit. If you could reduce them more, you got credits. Within 10 to 15 years, if you looked at maps or satellite photos in the United States, 95% of all the sulfur dioxide was gone. You created an incentive for people to replace old factories, eliminate SO2. And, it, and we don't have any articles anymore about how we're gonna die of acid rain. Uh, I wanna stress that you left one country out in North America called Mexico. And Mexico, in my opinion, this could be um, their best period of time the next 20 years. You. China cannot compete with Mexico in manufacturing many products. You can export from Mexico to Europe without tariffs. High quality cars are being manufactured and assembled. And so the question is, what is the new president and leadership gonna do in Mexico? And I think this comes back to your point of leadership. Uh, are they gonna seize defeat out of the jaws of victory here uh, by not importing gas from the United States, by not allowing private enterprise and others to come and develop their resources today. So these are challenges. But I want to move on, if I could, to something that we want to touch on tonight, and that is space. There you are have an many... interesting piece of tape, Michael, to roll. Okay, I just Let's... want to set the stage. There is a probability greater than zero that something could happen to Earth. There's a probability greater than zero that comes and can happen to our sun. Did the human race ever exist? Is there any member of the human race? The nearest star is four million light years away. And so the effort of Richard and others this, to take Michael, us Michael, this is to heavy space, stuff. It is, <laughs> but you think that you're, you talked about trade between countries. You know, one thing that will unite the Earth all together is just have some asteroid headed here that could do serious damage to our planet. We'll then all be combined. So I think this call to space, the call to movement, and the first effort is to make it a commercial enterprise. And, and I can't applaud Richard enough for reminding us of this call to space and the importance of it. So let's get into it, but before we start, I have a, a wonderful piece of tape I wanna show you. Can we roll that? It's about Richard's endeavors here in space. The exploration of space will go ahead. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. Humans have managed to learn so much about the universe in such a relatively small time frame compared with the life of the universe. That was always very incredible to me. Armed. Armed. Our mission is to lower the barrier to getting into orbit so that businesses and entrepreneurs, universities and countries can bring capabilities into space that help us here on Earth. As a species, we've traveled around our planet at the same speed for the last 50 to 60 years. You know, Spaceship Two is gonna be the first space plane that on a regular basis flies humans faster than three times the speed of sound. 
by bringing hundreds and eventually thousands of people into space. They'll get a different perspective on life and on our future. That will have a profound impact on how humanity faces its toughest problems. Together, we can make space accessible in a way that has only been dreamt of before now. And by doing that, we can truly bring positive change to life on Earth. Richard, your words were, I want to democratize space. What does that mean? Uh, how many people in this room would like to go to space? OK, that's your answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I find in a typical room, 60 70% of people would love the chance to become, uh, become astronauts, uh, to, you know, to, to go into space, to look back at this beautiful Earth we live on, uh, come back wanting to protect it even more. Um, uh, and also with Virgin Orbit, I mean, there are four and a half billion people who are not connected. Um, we will be putting a massive array of satellites up around the Earth and connecting those four and a half billion people. And if you're not connected, it's very difficult to start a business. You know, education, health, a lot, a lot of other things don't go for it. So, um, so that, yeah, that's roughly what I mean. Is this a for-profit enterprise? I hope so. <laughs> um, I mean, enterprises like this do not, um, do not survive unless they're for profit. Um, and, you know, I've invested over a billion dollars. We've had uh, a wonderful partner here in Abu Dhabi who's um, been, you know, been our principal partner to date. And, and without them, I don't think we'd be watching this, this video today. Um, and also, I had some rather exciting talks today in Abu Dhabi. Um, I can't say too much, but I'm going to give something away, I think. Uh, there's only spaceports in America, uh, China, and Russia. Where else would people like to have a spaceport? <laughs> well, that anyway, may be news. Watch this, watch this space, as they say. Michael, you've had an interest in space as well. You obviously have a passion for it, and that's a, a, a dark vision you've got of us having to leave the planet for various reasons that aren't financial. Well, when you're an investor, you like to hedge your portfolio. So my point is, the probability is very low, but it's greater than zero. Okay, do you want to know that humans ever existed? What is our message? We haven't figured out how to travel faster than the speed of light yet. So we need to both protect our planet, but also have vehicles, if we need to, that could go out in space and sustain life. And this, to me, encourages if you think about space, it really isn't written enough about today, and I believe it will be. 1957, Sputnik went up. In the middle of the Cold War, communism was superior to the free enterprise system. They put up this little ball that went around. I'm a student in elementary school. Okay. I was awoken to what the mission was. The country of the United States was scared. People didn't know what to do. The Soviet Union thought it was its finest hour that communism had won. This was the day the Soviet Union ended. It woke up the United States. DARPA was formed. NAS NASA was formed. And an economy 40 times the size was awakened to go to space. And the President of the United States you know, said we're going there not because it's easy, but because it's hard, and it gathered the interest of the world. Many things have happened. And to me, when you go and look at this, our Earth, this blue ball, anyone who loves space, yes, I wrote the President of the United States in 57, telling him I wanted to run the space program. I didn't tell him I was 11, but, you know, it didn't work. 
but it's hard not to feel the oneness on the planet. Sheikh Nayan reminded us of the importance of humanity and tolerance tonight in Abu Dhabi. And I think you can't be out there and look back at this earth and realize there isn't anything else like this within four million light years and no one's gonna make it there today. And there might not be anything like it out there at all. And you can't wanna do anything but protect this planet. So to me, it has many missions. It's not just the exhilaration of going to space, but it's the understanding of how small this planet is in the universe and how important it is to protect it and how we are one and how we gotta create opportunities for all. So I think it fulfills many missions and as Richard says, nothing is really sustainable ultimately unless it makes a profit and is economically sustainable. I love that it's an optimistic note we're ending on. Thank you very much. I'd like a warm hand for these marvelous entrepreneurs. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Michael. Take care, everybody.